really excited to talk tonight uh, with you about King David, and the Lord's given me a few things to share as a way of kind of creating a sandbox for us to engage with the Holy Spirit uh, through His Word. So we are reading through 1 Samuel 26 through 2 Samuel chapter 10. There was also two Psalms this week, Psalm 56, Psalm 60, uh, and we also read through some of Chronicles, and those were parallel passages uh, detailing the story that we're reading in 1 and 2 Samuel. So, uh, But a, a few thoughts. I love what Krista was saying, and it set, set up perfectly what's in my heart as an intro tonight for King David. Um, the Lord is... The Lord, um, he works with human beings. He calls us. We're made in his image. Uh, the Bible says not one day of our lives uh, passes. They were all recorded in his book. And so the idea of God using human agency is really a mind-blowing thing. And you can even see David's wonderment at that, that, Lord, you you consider me, I'm just dust, right? That you That your thoughts are more than the sands of the seashore. For example, in Psalm 139, um, you know, the, the fact that the God of the universe uh, is engaging in human endeavors uh, and his thoughts towards us are greater than the sands of the seashore. It's just a mind blowing reality. And David is a very special character in God's story. Um, to think that Jesus uh, is the son of David, and he is forever going to be known as that and chose to come through this man's lineage uh, through the, the covenant promises. And we're going to we're going to touch on that briefly tonight in Second Samuel uh, chapter seven, where the where the Lord establishes the Davidic dynasty. Um, but this idea that uh, David is just a very special figure. I think uh, Pastor Sylvia said last week, his name is mentioned over a thousand times in the scripture. He wrote amazing passages in the scripture, uh, anointed by the Holy Spirit. To the, he's an oracle of God, uh, this man. And, and in fact, the Lord says of David in Isaiah 55, verse 4, he says, I set David as my witness among the peoples. I set him as a commander over the nations. And so this idea of David's life is a witness to us. God is saying something to us through David. And Jesus is the greater manifestation of David, you know, and same thing with Moses. Jesus said, you know, you heard Moses say, but one that is greater than Moses is now here. So Jesus is uh, everything that David was perfected in, in the Father. But God wants us to look at David's life and draw some understanding from his story, because God set his story in the midst of the peoples to understand God. Uh, you know, what Sylvia was saying to us last week is so key. This is about God, but God working through humanity, through human agency, through raising up men and women, just like you and me, from humble beginnings, uh, from the ash heap, he's going to bring beauty from ashes. And so I love David's story. And what was in my heart was, uh, this idea, again, that he's the witness, God's witness amongst the peoples. And I felt the Lord just show me 10 character traits he wants us to kind of glean from King David's life in these chapters. So we're, I'm just looking at these were these were manifesting in David's heart and life and his story uh, from chapter 26 through 2 Samuel 10. So by no means is this exhaustive or comprehensive. And these are the 10 that I felt the Lord really highlight to me. I'm interested in hearing maybe some other thoughts from uh, folks that are studying this uh, as we get into the Q&A and just discussion time. Um, but the first trait that I want to focus on about David, and again, um, this is a, a picture of God. How is David the man after God's own heart? How does he exemplify that? Uh, point number one, or character trait number one, is David was merciful. And in 1 Samuel 26, we have a, another story where God allows David to be tested. He allows Saul to fall into David's hands. David creeps into Saul's camp, takes the jug and the spear, and melts back up into the mountains. 
and then calls down to Saul and says, I could have done it again. I could have killed you, Saul, um, but I didn't. And this, listen to what he says here. I'm going to read it. I love this. He says, uh, the Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal. And I refuse to kill you even when the Lord placed you in my power. For you are the Lord's anointed one. And now may the Lord value my life, even as I have valued yours today. May he rescue me from all my troubles. David showed mercy. God shows mercy. And here's God's servant, David, who's tested. His own men want him to kill Saul. In fact, the man that is with David, one of his mighty men says, I can kill him with one blow. I can pin this man to the ground right now. This could all be over. We can anoint you as king. Let's just get on with this. Tired of living in caves, David. David, not going to do it because he fears the Lord, but he shows mercy. Uh, t- sorry, Terrence, I see that's uh, chapter 26, verses 23 and 24 uh, is this passage that I'm referring to. And he gives Saul mercy. But listen, but don't miss this either. He is doing it not because of Saul. Saul didn't ask for forgiveness. Saul's not going to relent. There's not going to be reconciliation with Saul, even though David, for his part, is open to it. Uh, he does it because he says, maybe God, I want, I want God to show me mercy. So to the merciful, God shows mercy. To the faithful, God shows himself faithful. To the kind, God's going to be kind. We read what we sow. And David understands this in his DNA. Um, in fact, you can see him even realizing God's with him. Remember when he fights Goliath and he says, look, God was with me with the, the lion and the bear and the wolf. He was with me. I know he's got me when I go to fight the, the giant. And so David in his DNA just knows God is with me and he's exemplifying the heart of God and God is merciful. Um, so David is exemplifying mercy uh, as a man after God's own heart. Um, second character trait I want to want to touch on is uh, perseverance and endurance. Um, David doesn't quit. That man is so full of godly grit. <laughs> he, it's amazing when you consider, you know, he's about 17 years old when he's anointed by Samuel. And then uh, he's anointed finally as king of Hebron when he's about 30. And then he's 37-ish when he finally inherits the entire kingdom of Israel. So 20 years from when he's anointed to when he actually is moved it fully into his position as the king of all of Israel. And he's running from Saul for 13 years. Saul dies. And then he's got a, this war with Ishbosheth. And there's Saul's dynasty is growing weaker and weaker and weaker. David's house is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. But it's not immediate. It's not overnight. David is hanging tough. And he, he strengthens himself in the Lord. I love the verse. First Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, he's actually fled to Israel's enemy. Um, and it doesn't go well for David and his mighty men there. They're tested uh, in an incredible way because the Amalekites come in, and you know the story. They raid David's camp. They take wives and children. They take everything. And they're about to kill David. They're about to stone him dead uh, because they've lost their families, and his men are exhausted, and they're tired. David has nobody but God. And he just digs down in that moment. It says he strengthens himself in the Lord. First Samuel 30, verse 6. And so there's this, this deep well of perseverance in David that even in the midst of all of that adversity, he doesn't despair. He doesn't question God. He doesn't doubt that God's with him. He does the opposite. He turns to God in that pressure, in that adversity, in that challenge, in the face of even his own death, David finds God. And so he's an example to us of the godly trait of perseverance, because in this life, we're going to have trouble. Um, We're going to be tested. God's going to refine our character. That's the purpose of hardship. You know, you can hear the apostle James chapter one, consider it all joy when you're going through trial and tribulation and hardship, because the hardship is going to perfect in you endurance and endurance, perseverance and perseverance, the formation of character godly character. God is after our hearts and he's refining us so that we will have his nature in us. We'll have the mind of Christ and we'll have the heart and the uh, obedience of God, the obedience of Christ in us. And David exemplifies that, that no quit, no despair, not going to give up hope, going to hang tough, 
I'm going to find, I'm going to, I'm going to find God in this circumstance, no matter what it takes. And God always brought him through. And so Ziklag is a great picture of that perseverance in action in David's life. It's not the only place, but it's certainly a big one. Um, uh, point number three, generous. David is a generous man. Um, God is a generous God. God gives freely. I love the story in Ziklag, and they have this amazing uh, victory. And they're coming back. They've got everybody, all the wives and the children. They've plundered the Amalekites. They've destroyed them. It's a big celebration. And then there's grumbling and complaining because David left a contingent of men behind to protect their equipment and supply line. And some of the men that were in the battle didn't want to, didn't want to share what they were given and what they plundered. And David said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to, we're going to honor our brothers who stood back here with the supplies and the equipment. Let's, we're going to share what the Lord has given us. That's a generous spirit uh, to share that which the Lord has given. And, uh, you know, there's the other example in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, he's uh, dancing before the Lord, which I'll come to in a minute, but it says he gives every Israelite man, woman, and child a loaf of bread, a cake of raisins, and a cake of dates. I don't know how many people is that, but that's, that's a lot of food. And that's just out of the overflow of this man's heart. He's giving. Uh, he's a giver. God's a giver. Um, you know, God gave his only begotten son. Uh, love gives. David is a lover. He loves God. And out of that love, he loves people. And he's giving generously uh, multiple times in these passages. And so uh, how is he an example of a man after God's own heart? He's a generous, he's a generous man. Uh, point number four, David is a man of loyalty and honor. I think this is really key. Even after everything that Saul had done to this man, and he'd done a lot, and when, when David finds out that Saul is dead, he mourns for him. He weeps for him, and he sings this amazing song in 2 Samuel chapter 1 about Saul and Jonathan, and he, he calls them heroes of Israel. And so there's this reverence in David that you can even see as he continues to say, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. God God touched Saul and put Saul in position. And David feared God and was like, I'm not, I'm not touching that which God is doing. I'm not going to touch it in an unholy way. He honored who God was, and he honored the way that God was uh, moving in the earth in his generation. He didn't touch the, the, the ones that God was anointing in an unholy way. And so David is a man of of amazing loyalty and honor. And I think this is um, very much in the heart of our God. And another reason why he's an example to us in the earth. Um, point number five is, is wisdom. David was, was wise. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't rush ahead of God. Uh, there's a, a couple of examples here. One of them is Ziklag we just were in. Um, and the other one is in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, when he asked the Lord after Saul's dead, he says, Lord, do you want me to go up to be king? And the Lord says, go, go up as far as Hebron. Uh, and before that in Ziklag, he, he asked the Lord, he inquires of the Lord and says, Lord, should we pursue the Amalekites? And so David, this exemplifies wisdom in that he's not presuming he knows what to do. <laughs> he's calling for the, for the priestly ephod. He's inquiring of the Lord and saying, Lord, what's, what do you want me to do in this situation? I don't know what to do. Do you want me to be king now? Go up as far as Hebron. Should we pursue the Amalekites? Yes, go and overtake them. I'm going to put them in your hands. And you can see this principle over and over and over again in David's life. He sought the Lord. He needed God's wisdom. And that knowing that you need God's wisdom is wisdom. That's like the wisest thing any of us could arrive at is the conclusion uh, Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge God and he'll make your path straight. And, you know, I think about that sometimes um, because we live in the day uh, that we think we're enlightened and we think we know so much. We think we're very sophisticated, uh, you know, <laughs> but I think about how much information and knowledge exists on the earth today that you could go and, and earn a doctorate degree in, uh, you know, biology and zoology, you could, you know, neuroscience, astronomy. I mean, there's so many fields of study that you could earn a doctorate in. How much of that knowledge on the earth, let's say there's 10,000 degrees. I don't know if there's that many, but let's just throw a number out. There's 10,000 
fields of study that you could become an expert in, how much of that knowledge do I possess in my mind right now? 0.000001% of the known knowledge in the universe. And if you were to actually talk to an expert in one of their fields, let's say it's neuroscience, we had the world's leading expert on neuroscience on this call. And we said, you know, Dr. Smith, um, can you have we arrived at the end of the knowledge of, of the field of neuroscience in your estimation? I promise you, he's going to say we're just beginning to understand this field. Right. Talk, talk to astronomy. Uh, yeah, we're just beginning to see the ends of the universe. Uh, you know, marine biology. We've only studied a, a small percentage of the ocean life that's out there. We, we don't know a lot. And I've given my life to this to this one field of study. I'm an expert, but I don't know much. We're at the scratch of the scratch of the scratch of the surface. And so the wisest thing a human being could do is say, I don't know. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding because I don't know very much. <laughs> I'm going to go to the one who knows everything and holds it all in his hands. That's the wisest thing for a human being to do. Um, to judge something that I haven't experienced or that I haven't seen or that I, I, a field of study I haven't even begun to think about. No, I'm just, it's simple obedience. And Dave, David understood this. David understood God is the God of all wisdom and he needs him every day to be talking to him, to give him his marching orders. Um, so in this way, I think David is an example to us of a wise uh, relationship that he had with God of just seeking the Lord's direction. Um, I love this verse. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, actually. Um, 2 Samuel 5.12, another key to David, um, humility. 2 Samuel 5.12, this is after Hiram has built David a palace. And David is now entered in, and he recognizes that God has established his, his reign. So he kind of emotionally enters in, and you might imagine what that might have felt like for David. He's been living in caves. Uh, he's been running from Saul. He hasn't, uh, he hasn't been home in a long time. He's been running for 13 years. Now he's been fighting a kind of a civil war with Ishbosheth and the rest of Saul's dynasty. And finally now he's at, at peace. The enemies are, are gone. God's established his reign, and he's kind of emotionally entering into this moment. And then we have 2 Samuel 5, 12, and it says, And David realized he was blessed for the sake of Israel. And this is a great key, I think, in David's heart. It wasn't about David, and David knew that. It was about God. See, God, God wanted a king over Israel. Israel was asking for a king. Um, in that concession that God made, God decided he was going to bring a man after his own heart to be the king because he wanted someone who's going to shepherd Israel with his heart. And so this uh, moment of, of clarity for David where he realized everything that he had been through in his life up until that point was all about preparing him experientially, uh, preparing him uh, with integrity and his character. To, he was being refined because he, he, he then realized he's just a conduit. God wants to pour through him upon all of Israel. And so as we live our lives, we have to remember that what we're going through is not just about us. It's not about us getting a big ministry platform or getting more and more material blessing or more and more fame or all the things that the world says chase after. David understood, no, this is about God is wanting to use me to bring glory to his name and to be a blessing to this people. And so in that way, David was a man of, of extreme humility. Um, he never made it about himself. Um, and so I love that about David. I love that passage of scripture, 2 Samuel 5, 12. Um, and as we go to point number seven, David is a worshiper. He's a passionate worshiper. <laughs> I, I asked myself as I was reading this, like, what is the high point of David's uh, reign as king? You know, he has some amazing victories. He extends the borders of Israel, takes Jerusalem, uh, establishes uh, his, his kingdom. He gets the building project for the temple going. Obviously, Solomon's going to be the one that's going to build the temple for God. But what is the high mark? And I was thinking about this uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 6. I think it's when he's 
abandoned in worship to God in front of all of Israel. He's wearing a priestly uh, ephod or tunic, and he's dancing um, and just abandoned as a lover of God. After all that God had brought him through, uh, you know, I think about, this is the Old Testament equivalent, I think, of uh, the alabaster jar that Mary breaks over Jesus uh, in John chapter 12. After Lazarus is raised from the dead and Mary goes and grabs that alabaster jar and anoints Jesus in this extravagant worship moment where it's like she doesn't know what else to do in her heart. She's undone because Jesus has raised her brother from the dead. There's Lazarus at the table. She said, what do I have of value in my home? I don't have it. I'm going to go get the most valuable thing I have right now, which is this perfume. And I'm going to just, I don't know anything else to do, but I'm just going to pour it out on, on this one that I love. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to abandon myself. I'm going to be lovesick in this moment because he has undone me with his, his kindness to me and his, his miraculous touch in my life. I can't contain it with uh, godly stoicism. <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to be uh, extravagant and point out on Jesus. That's Mary. But in the Old Testament, we have this example of David, whose heart in the same way, Lord, you've delivered me from all my enemies. You've come through for me. You, you delivered me. He says, you delivered me because you delight in me. He knows that God delights in him. And so he is undone by God's goodness and his faithfulness and his mercy. Who am I that you would even think of me? Is David's, that humility again coming out of David. But he's just going for it in front of all of Israel. Lovesick, passionate worshiper of God. And I think this is the high point. Uh, of his reign uh, is this example to us of lo a lover of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we see this in the life of David in these moments of just, wow, rare and extravagant worship and focus on God. Uh, point number eight, David is uh, is servant-hearted as a king. Number one, he's a servant to the Lord. And we see this in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He looks around and he realizes, okay, I've got this palace now. I've been established, but you know, God doesn't have a house. And he's, this bothers David. God's done all this for me. I want to do something for God. I want to give God a house. I'm not going to give my eyelids rest. I got to find a dwelling for the, the Lord God of Israel. And he's, he's consumed by his, this desire. So God sends Nathan to him in chapter 7 and says, no, you tell David this. I'm going to establish a dynasty in his line. What? The, you know, go ahead and do what you're planning, David, but it's not, it's not going to be you. It'll be your son. Solomon's going to do this. But you're desiring a good thing. But I just love that David's heart is is postured as I want to serve the, I want to serve God. I want to do something for the Lord. And that's the king after God's own heart over Israel. And so David is a servant hearted king. We see that horizontally as well, as he serves many people in his reign um, with a lot of kindness and humility. But first and foremost, he's, he knows that he's a servant of God. Uh, Point number nine, how's he an example to us? He's courageous. Um, he's a warrior. There's so many times David goes into battle and God is with him. I love in, in uh, the whole chapter, chapter eight and chapter 10, you can read about Second Samuel. God is, says God is giving him victories everywhere he went. You know, God is, is still expanding the, the inheritance of Israel. He's still, the borders are expanding. They're still defeating their enemies. And David is going into battle uh, as a warrior. We see this fearlessness in him, even with Goliath, even as a young man, uh, you know, he <laughs> goes in, with, in against Goliath with just a, a sling and his shepherd staff. But that's what it looks like on the surface. But from the heavenly, he's going in armed with the God of Israel in his corner. And David understood 
that God is with him. So who could be against him? And so there's just this momentum in David's, in his warrior life, that he is, he is a threshing sledge in the hands of God. And God is threshing Israel's enemies through this warrior priest king, uh, who's a worshiper. And, and so we see this, and David is courageously going into combat, leading his men. Uh, I think that's an example to us as disciples. Um, you know, in the book of Revelation, it says there's a, there's a list says that these are the people that are not going to inherit the kingdom of God, the adulterers and the immoral and the, those that are engaging in witchcraft. But it also says the cowardly. Um, you know, we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and not loving our lives so as to shrink back from death. And so David is this picture of bold courage in the face of death. Time and time and time again, he, he puts his own neck on the line to serve God and to serve his purpose in his generation. Uh, he was ridiculed. Even in the example where he is an abandoned worshiper, his own wife is disdaining him. He's mocked for his stance with God, but doesn't dissuade him. He says, I'll become even more undignified than this. <laughs> and you think about Mary, too, Mary of Bethany, again, going back with the alabaster jar. You know, she gets criticized for anointing Jesus with that extravagant worship. Judas stands up and says, you know, this should have been given to the poor. This is absurd amount of money that, that is being wasted here. Um, and the Bible says, well, he is, <laughs> he's actually skimming off the top of the treasury. So Judas is all in it for, for personal profit and gain. And so when we live lives of abandoned worship and, you know, courage before the Lord, you're going to have critics. You're going to have people who doubt you. They're going to question your motives. They're going to look at you and say, that's just ridiculous. But I love that David just, he didn't, he didn't let the critics and the haters uh, keep him from doing what God called him to do. He was faithful. And I love the quote from Teddy Roosevelt. The credit belongs to the man or the woman in the, in the arena, not the critic in the stands. And so David's a man who's in the arena. David has earned his scars and his stripes. He's gone through the fire. He's been wounded. He's been doubted. He's been hated. He's been hunted. And he, he knows God's with him and God's established him. And so I love David's heart of a courageous warrior. Uh, and finally, the, the, the tenth character trait that I felt the Lord was uh, emphasizing as David is an example to us as the peoples of the earth is in his kindness. Um, David was very kind. Uh, I love the story in 2 Samuel chapter 9 with Mephibosheth, is Jonathan's son who's been crippled. And David is thinking to himself, I want to do something for Jonathan. I love my friend. He's dead. How can I bless Jonathan's line? How can I bless Jonathan's family? I know I'm going to find his descendant, Mephibosheth. And he brings Mephibosheth in. He eats at his table every day and he gives, uh, you know, Saul's lands to Mephibosheth and Mephibosheth's servant Ziba to farm. And so he extends kindness to a man who, who needed help. You know, he was uh, crippled as a boy when he was dropped. And so uh, I'm sure this wasn't an, an amazing, I mean, Mephibosheth enters in and says, man, who am I, my Lord, the King, that you would do this for me. But that's what David says to God all the time. Who am I, God, that you're going to do this to me? You're being so kind to me. You're going to establish my dynasty. I want to, I want to build you a house, but you're going to establish my dynasty forever. I, who am I that you're being this kind to me, Lord? And here's, David extending kindness, and Mephibosheth is saying to David what David says to God, my Lord, the King, who am I that you would be this kind to me? I love that, you know, and David is learning because he's beholding God as a worshiper. He's becoming like God. His focus is God, and so God, he begins to act like more like God uh, in, in some of these amazing ways. And so as we worship God, as we spend time with God, even as we're going through the Bible and this Bible study, you know, the more we're talking about God, the more we're thinking about God, praying, worshiping, we become like that which we behold. And so David is taking on these characteristics. God is kind. And so David is kind. God is merciful. David is showing mercy. God is generous. David is generous. God displays loyalty and honor. David displays loyalty and honor. God is wise and David is growing in wisdom. And so uh, those are 10 keys 
uh, in terms of traits in the life of David in these in these verses. And I also want to close out just by contrasting in this. There's a lot of great characters uh, in these stories. And so it's too much content to try and smash into this little session here. But I do want to contrast David and Saul as kings because I think the Bible sets us up that way. Um, real simple. Uh, David feared God. Saul feared man. David trusted God. Saul took control in his own strength. David was secure and at peace in God's presence. Saul was insecure and always troubled. He was always looking over his shoulder. David's identity was in God. He knew God. He knew who he was in God. And Saul's identity was in his position. David was a man of integrity, and he resisted evil urges. Saul was an immoral man, and he compromised his integrity on a regular basis. David was loving and loyal. Saul was jealous and bitter and spiteful, even to his own son. You know, it's a stunning scripture when Saul chucks a spear at Jonathan, when Jonathan sticks up for David. Um, my goodness, Saul is consumed with paranoia and jealousy to the point where he's, he's even trying to kill his own son at one point. Um, and finally, David is submitted and surrendered to God's will. Uh, Saul is rebellious and David's humble and, and Saul is proud. And so in these ways, these two kings are set up in contrast to one another. And we see, uh, just like the scripture said in this passage, Saul's dynasty goes weaker and weaker and weaker. David's get stronger and stronger and stronger. In fact, Jesus rules and reigns on David's throne forever because of what happened in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God enters into that Davidic covenant with David and says, you will have a descendant on your throne in my presence forever. That's why Jesus is called the son of David. God found a man, this example in all the earth, the commander of the peoples, and Jesus is the greater King David. And God enters into this covenant with David for all time, establishing the Messiah, Jesus. And so when we read in the New Testament, people calling out, son of David, have mercy on me, son of David. They're confessing, that means they're, they're, they're confessing that they know that Jesus is the Messiah. They believe. It's that faith that then releases the miraculous, the signs and the wonders in their midst, because they believe that Jesus is the son of David, and he is the Messiah. He is the promised seed that's going to crush the serpent's head. So those are my thoughts that I have for us tonight to kind of get, get us started on our discussion. A um, couple of questions to throw out. Uh, what I'm interested, if there are any stories uh, that jumped out to you all, what did God reveal to you about himself in this week's portion? And would love to hear some thoughts. So I'll go ahead and open the floor. Feel free to unmute and jump in. Well, I'd like to share. I got, I got so touched. I get emotional when I feel the presence of the Lord and feel the presence of the Lord so strong on this Bible study tonight. Praise the Lord. But I love the part in 2 Samuel 7 where God says, go tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build the house for me to live in? I've never lived in a house from the day I, I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I've never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people, Israel. I've never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar home? I just love because I love God's beautiful heart. Mm. Just this beautiful heart that he says, I've never complained. And, and just how beautiful he is that he would live in a tent and give the Israelites everything because he's so generous and, and loving. Anyway, that just touched me. God's mm. beautiful heart touched me. So I just, I wanted to share that. 
and, and I love David's heart for the Lord, that abandonment dancing, I dance for the Lord, but I would love to dance for the Lord like David danced for the Lord in front of everybody. I, I just love that. I love David's heart for the Lord. So I just beautiful. love his word. Well, so good. Thank you, Chantel. Wonderful. Other, uh, other thoughts out there? I'm amazed at how David, after everything that Abner um, wanted to do to him, um, when he died, um, he still mourned for him. I mean, I think about a son who wants to kill you, who wants to take, a thro take your throne that was given to you uh, uh, by God. And not not just you know a throne that was giving handed over to you. You 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 literally fought for it. I mean, all his life he gave it to God, going through all the uh, uh, hardships. I don't know if I'm getting the story right, but um, um, I'm just amazed at how he turned around and was mourning for the person who wanted to kill him. You know, I, I don't I don't know. Uh, first of all, I see uh, forgiveness. All right, I don't know uh, how, how how many of us would turn around and mourn for. Someone we knew literally wanted to kill us. And not only that, he was his son, but, you know, I, I, I think of it this way. There is a popular saying that those who are closest to you are the ones who hurt you the more. Well, that's, that was his son. So I could just imagine how that was painful for him to know that his own son wants to kill him for his throne. And then he turns around and mourns for him. So that story there was a great uh, if anything, another revelation of how merciful he was and why God really loved him. You know, he didn't want to kill his son. I, I'm, I'm reminded that even he he instructed his soldiers not to kill him when when they pers when they were in pursuit of him. You know, even though they disobeyed his orders, but he don't kill him. I know he wants me dead, but don't kill him. So if anything, I'm reminded about that aspect of David that God really saw one of those character traits that you talked about, Pastor Jed, that he was a merciful person. And God is looking for, 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 for that character trait in, in, in each and every one of us, that we need to be merciful even to those whom we know want to hurt us um, in, in every way, shape, or form. So I was blessed by that story. Amen. Amen. This is, uh, uh, you're talking about Absalom. And uh, that that is going to be in next week's reading. You you're like Krista. You're 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 moving ahead, which is awesome. When chapter eleven opens up, we're going to see another side of David here uh, <laughs> that opens up that he makes some some really tough mistakes, and and Absalom is going to come here in a few chapters. But I love what you said, Terrence, because again, you know, the heart of David, even in the midst of those challenging circumstances, uh, and he's responsible for some of those circumstances that are unfolding. He still is trying to do the right thing, even if that meant he, he was willing to walk away from being king. He says at one point, maybe the Lord's done with me being king, so I'm going to leave, and Absalom can have the position. That's the exact opposite of King Saul. David could take or leave the position. It was never about being king for David. It was about God, and it was about what God was doing, and hey, maybe God's finished with me, and maybe it's time for somebody else to run this, uh, run the kingdom. He was willing to step aside. And then God wasn't done with him yet. But I appreciate what you said, Terrence. Thank you uh, for that. We're going to talk a lot more about Absalom and uh, Joab and Bathsheba and Amnon and, and Tamar next week. There's a lot that's going to happen. Amen. You know, I want to just Amen. jump right in here and say that same thing. And that is that uh, Terrence, like Krista, are overachievers. Praise the <laughs> Lord. We love that. Glory yes. to God. We know when you start reading, you don't want to stop. Amen. Uh, but going back to pick up what he did allude to before he went to Absalom is Abner and Abner was the commander. I mean, he was, yeah, he was literally over Saul's army. And so when Saul was trying to kill David, he was with Saul and he was a part of that. And you're absolutely right, Terrence, because you started there and then you went on further in, you know, because again, you're overachiever. We appreciate that. Amen. Uh, but uh, glory to God, Abner, uh, again, even after Saul died. And what I find so interesting is, is that, you know, once uh, Saul's son 
made him angry. He admitted that God had told David that he was supposed to be king way back when. And because you have accused me of sleeping with your father's concubine, you know, am I, am I a dog? Am I a flea? What's really going on? I'm going to ensure that David is king. And he goes to see David and tells David, I'm going to give you your heart's desire and I'm going to bring all of Israel unto you. And we see some things unfold. Whole Joab decided, you know, because that's what I love about both David and uh, Abner. In essence, they both understood that your conduct in war is different than your conduct in peacetime. Amen. And so they made amends and were forgiven one another and were ready to move on. Joab, because his brother had been killed by Abner, he had a different heart. He had unforgiveness. He did not understand the rules of engagement because on a battlefield, they're absolutely different than in the time of peace. And that's why David got so upset with him because he should have known better. And what did he do? Because he wanted revenge instead of understanding that vengeance is the Lord's. Amen. Uh, he decided to create his own plot. He even went and chastised David and David wasn't moved. So then he sent for Abner, had Abner to come back like he wanted to talk to him. And he killed him because he had killed his brother on the battlefield. And David, again, did not know that. But when he heard about it, his response was that mercy, that grace, that brokenness. And he began to exalt Abner is being a great man, and just like he did Saul, uh, the king who tried to kill him. And I love how the Bible says that, you know, because of David's response, you know, he's mourning and all of this and, and telling them what they're going to do, even made Joab do the same thing. And his brother, you know, look, he's going to get in this formation. You're going to go ahead and tear your clothes and have shit. Uh, uh, sackcloth and ashes as well so he wasn't going to the going through the motions and when the people come to david and try to give david to eat some food david said mm -mm, if i eat anything before the sun goes down you know may god do unto me and he didn't and the bible says that the people saw what david did and they really really knew he did not have anything to do with abner's death and the people approved of everything that David did. David was genuine in his love for God. And when you genuinely love God, that love in that intimate relationship between you and God trickles out and it will cause you to love your enemies. David is a foreshadowing of the very heart the mind and the and the ways of Christ Jesus. Christ loved his enemies. That's why he told us to love our enemies. Bless those who curse us. Pray for those who despitefully use us. David was doing all of that. Amen. And Christ took it even to another level. And what I believe we ought to understand is, as you said before, Jed, the more that we are with him, the more we become like him. And it's not something that someone has to, you know, uh, force us into doing. It comes naturally. You love your enemy. You can do good to those who despitefully use you. Why? Because Chantel alluded to it, the great heart of God. God is so loving. He is so kind. And that's not a one of us that's sitting here that deserves any of it. We didn't earn it. It was freely given. We freely received. And so we are freely to give. God cause us to love the way that you do. Cause us to be able to see not the worst in people, but the best because we see you and we are quick to forgive. Amen. So good, Sylvia. Thank you for your amazing insight. You know, it is interesting in the story of with Abner. Um, 
And Joab is an interesting character that is coming, becoming more and more prominent now that Jonathan is out of the picture. Jonathan was supposed to be David's right-hand man, and, uh, and Joab is now in, in, in that position, unfortunately. But in this sense, I want, I want us to catch this. We're going to, this is kind of jumping forward a little, ahead, a little ahead in the story, but I think it's important. You know, David is offended at Joab for murdering Abner. But when it comes time for David to cover up his sin with Bathsheba, he unleashes Joab as the man, the kind of the, the rabid dog. And Joab is the one that positions Uriah the Hittite to be killed. Um, and so in one sense, there's a hypocrisy where David, David is, you know, Joab as a murderer is an offense to David. And then who does David unleash when he needs a murderer is Joab. And then who is it that kills Absalom? God says, the sword's never going to leave your house, David, because of what you've done with the sword of the Ammonites. You killed Uriah. Now the sword is never going to leave your house. Joab is the one that kills Absalom. So the sword that David used to kill Uriah comes back. He reaps what he sows. And Joab is the one, even though David told him explicitly, do not kill my son. Joab is the one that, that ends up killing David's son that he loved, even though Absalom was treacherous. And so we just see how the repercussions of our, of our choices, the repercussions of our sins, um, we can be forgiven. It doesn't mean there aren't consequences. And so we do reap what we sow. Uh, and even in this story, we're seeing that setting itself up here uh, with who Joab is as a character uh, and David actually tells Solomon to kill Joab. Joab ends up getting killed uh, himself. Um, so he reaps what he sows eventually as well. So that law of reaping and sowing, we can see throughout David's life here and some of the lives of the characters in the story. Um, other thoughts out there? Amen. So what really blessed me was the part when you uh, were uh, uh, giving down the points of wisdom. was what really blessed me that David had wisdom in that he never made a move without asking God. And in today's life, I know um, I'll speak for myself. I make my decisions. I feel like, oh, I have the strength. I'll wake up the next day and I'll do it. But when we see in the Bible where God said, uh, said to the rich man that you, uh, you, he said, I think it was you, you're a fool. You make, you make plans without knowing if you make, if you see the next day and all those stuff. And truly we make moves in life without even seeking God's approval without even seeking his consent, if this, if what we are making, if, if, if what we are deciding to do or the plans we are making is right for us or right in the eyes of God, you know, we don't even know the the, 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 the dangers that are ahead of us with those plans that we are taking, with those moves that we are, we are making and all those things. So what really blessed me was the fact that he had the wisdom to always ask God, should I make this move? Should I go here? Should, should I go here? Should I take go to those places? All those things. And it is very important to God because it, may, it means you're putting him first. It means you're seeking him in all your ways. You're seeking him in everything that you're doing. So that really blessed me. And I pray for that wisdom. So always see God first in everything that I'm doing. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hortensia. Wonderful. You know, and the flip of that is the one time that he didn't, we saw the consequences and it goes right into what Pastor uh, Jed talked about. The sword never left his home. He did not take time out to consult God when it came to that one. And God even says it, except for that one indiscretion. And that was Bathsheba. And it led him down a path of destruction in his family. It ordered a, it opened a portal that gave the enemy legal right and authorization to come in and to do the things that was going on. Amen. So we must be ever so careful to seek God, ask God, and make sure, God, this is what you are saying. This is what you will have me to do, because there are consequences when we do it in our own strength, in our own might, or we are ruled by emotions. We're ruled by lust. We're ruled by other things that are not of God. There are consequences. And here's what I love. And that's what we all 
so should see, even though we're still ahead of everything. Um, we should also see and know that God can forgive us, but the consequences are still there. Mm -hmm. He will forgive and he will love us, but the consequences do not stop. Amen. There are still some things that will come to pass because of the choices that we make and the choices that we make do not just affect us. They affect our loved ones as well. That's right, Pastor Sylvia. And, and leaders are held to a higher standard. Um, to whom much is given, much will be required. And, uh, you know, with David, it is interesting, um, you know, earlier in his story, you might remember when he's running from Saul, he goes to the priests and the priests give him the bread of the presence to eat. He's hungry. And the priest says, I'll give this food to you on one condition that none of your men have, uh, have slept with women. David says, no, when we're on campaign, when we're at war, like Sylvia said, our conduct is a certain way when we're at war. And we never do this when we're, so when we're at war and we're on campaign, we, we're, there's no uh, sexual immorality going on. So he gives him the bread of the presence. But then you might notice as we, we're going to turn the page into chapter 11, it starts in the springtime when kings go on campaign and war, David was on his roof. And so it starts, he had his own, his, he had his own principle and he violates it uh, himself by, he should have been out with those men on, on campaign. And I believe that if Jonathan had been there, versus Joab, I think Jonathan would have would have come back to David and said, hey, brother, you know, we never do this. Remember, when you when you're on campaign, you're with us. Don't send us out on war without you coming with us. And I, unfortunately, Joab is now the leader instead of Jonathan of David's army. And so David is left isolated. And I think there's a lesson there for us, too, that who are our Jonathans in our life that have our back? And are you a Jonathan in someone's life where you can have their back and say, hey, wait a minute, something's not right. We're supposed to be on campaign. You know, I just want to protect you from falling into some an isolated incident where you can be tempted beyond uh, what is what you're going to be able to overcome on your own. We need to have each other's backs as we're walking out our faith life so that we don't compromise. And that's part of uh, the unraveling that we're about to see as we you know, go forward from here in David's story. And Pastor Jed, I love that because I think we should also take a note of, of isolation. Uh, it's dangerous. Um, you know, the old saying that uh, an idle mind is the, is the house of uh, the devil. You know, he, that's where he, he operates more. Uh, when you isolate yourself, you pretty much separate yourself from things that are uh, much more important, you know, or you you just aren't doing much for yourself, whether it be for spiritual self-improvement or physical self-improvement. So isolation is where the devil wants you. That's his uh, uh, playing ground uh, to get you to do what he wants you to do. Because if you're not reading the word, if you're not spending time with the word, if you separate yourself from people who can be your Jonathan, um, I think pretty much you leave yourself open to, uh, uh, you know, deception, lies, I think that's what also plays in plays out when people uh, meditate in these yogas. You know, they isolate themselves and open their minds for the devil to come and really pollute them in their thoughts and their ways. So uh, that says a lot about isolation. It is dangerous. Uh, I think that's why it's important for us to be active in our in our various churches. Uh, uh, always filling your time with either uh, godly activities or activities that help to improve your life either on a physical or a spiritual level. I mean, I, I love that part about isolation. Very important. Amen. Um, I, I'll mention one, another characteristic, and I don't, I, I don't know if this is a characteristic, maybe it's just, maybe it's a discipline that I see um, that is worked out in David. And it's in Psalm 131, um, verse two, and it says, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child, I'm content. 
And so the NLT says, instead, I have calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child is my soul within me. So David was one that learned how to quiet himself because, you know, the Bible talks about that we are body, soul, and spirit. And so he learned how to quiet his soul. It's almost like the thoughts that run through our mind that distract us from just being quiet and still before the Lord. And I believe that in learning how to quiet himself before the Lord, he learned how to hear from God in a, in a much deeper way, because we obviously see there's lots of conversation he's having with the Lord and lots of wisdom that's coming through him that God is giving him. But I believe that it's a result of, of that, of learning how to quiet ourselves, because it's like blocking out the noise. And if you think about it, when it says like a weaned child who's no longer on milk, you know, our our souls can sometimes be like, um, you know, like that little nagging kid. Hey, 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 is it time to go? Is it time to go? Hey, what's for lunch? Hey, you know and I mean? It's like all these other things when you're trying to just be still with God and you're thinking, you know, did I cook dinner? You know, all these things running through that can run through our mind. But it's a discipline, I think, to learn how to just truly become still before God. You know, and we see that it's a truth because it's in the word that he learned it. He learned how to do it. That's, that's an awesome point, Krista. Um, I love that word contentment. You know, you think about, uh, he also says it in Psalm 23, right? Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, he trusts in God's provision. You can hear the Apostle Paul saying, you know, I've learned to be content in abundance and, and in lack. You know, that there is this discipline, this place that we can get to where um, we're just resting in what God has for us right now in the moment. And he, it's enough because he's enough. And I can go without something that my flesh or my soul is longing for. I can shut that down and just turn, tune in and press into his presence uh, right now. And just have that connection is feeding my soul. You know, you think about Jesus who said, you know, uh, I have food that you don't know about when I do the will of my father. Right. And there's the food that we eat physically, and then there's this relational spiritual nourishment that comes from obedience and from communing with God in spirit and in truth. And I think you're right. I think David was tapping into something as a worshiper, um, and through all that pressure he was on, it taught him um, you know, to lean and depend on God in some very deep and profound ways. Any other thoughts out there that jumped out, character traits uh, that, that resonated with you about David in this part of his life, in this part of the story? Yeah, good evening, everybody. I just think it's a wonderful time tonight and just great, great information and good food and all this this um, good wisdom about David. And the one thing that really jumped out is that all these characteristics and attributes that um, David had that just just mirrored the father's heart um just got the power of god coming out in wisdom and in courage and a warrior and mercy and worship and um i'm kind of talking about second samuel 5 10 and he became more and more powerful because the lord god almighty was with him so all the the wonderful lists that we've been talking about tonight that you brought forward pastor and that everybody's expounded on is just in a nutshell you know God's so powerful and all those characteristics represent his power being in us and, and all God's natures and his, his characteristics, his attributes, his names, everything that represents him. You know, when we let him, his presence is with us and in us, it, it dwells in within us and it's around us. And then when God manifests his presence, um, it, it's just a beautiful thing. And I just, you know, everything that we've talked about tonight is God's manifest presence in, in David's life. And it just tees up you know, our Savior. And it just puts glory right on everything that Jesus has done in tandem, um, you know, just fulfilling everything prophetically from, from King David. So it's just been a wonderful time tonight to share. I I'd agree as well that Jed, Pastor Jed, this was this is such a good teaching to kind of run through these attributes that we see in King David, because it gives us the ability to um, apply the word, 
You know, it really does take these stories that we're reading, the history of Israel, which we see it's so much more than just history. It's the word of God that's living. And now this living word, we can apply the word through the wisdom of gleaning from those who were before us, you know, and seeing, obviously, he was a forerunner of Christ. And there's all these examples that we really can check ourselves against. And to, you know, we're supposed to model and emulate Christ. And these are all the same, you know, in Christ. And so to me, I've written this list down and I just think, you know, this would even be a good list to text myself. And when I have moments where maybe I'm falling short on some of this, just remind myself of the list, you know, it's, it's, um, the fruit of the spirit obviously produces these things in us, but sometimes we just need to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves too, you know? <laughs> Love that. Well, it's interesting, you know, when, uh, when Krista, you and Jackie were sharing, you know, Jackie was talking about God's power. You, you know, we tend to look externally, and that's one of the lessons that, that God says too, right? Man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. You know, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And evil deeds issue forth from a wicked heart. Good deeds issue forth from a good heart. And so we're talking about an, in God's power coming in the inner man that his word goes into us, we're having a relationship with him on the inside and something is changing in our inner man. And the power comes out, not because circumstances externally are changing, the circumstances are whatever they are, but the power comes from within. As our hearts become more like Christ, as our nature, our character becomes more like him, those, all that harvest of the seeds that God has sown into our lives, the word of God, and he, there's going to be a 30, 60, and 100 fold harvest. It grows over time. It's not, you know, with David, it took 20 years before he, you know, entered into the fullness of what God had for him. But he was changed on the inside. You know, God wasn't changing just the circumstances. God changed the circumstances through his faith and through this, this co laboring where David pressed in on what God had given him. And David's faith was activated and God came through and the circumstances were, were blown away like smoke off the mountains. And I think that's another thing we have to think about is, you know, the kingdom of God, it's, it's, it's near us. God is as close as our next breath, right? We breathe in the Holy spirit and we breathe out stress and anxiety and all of the, 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 the flesh so we can walk by the spirit and bear the fruit of the spirit. No, there's a, another interesting thing that we cannot um, miss. And what we need to make sure that we understand in all of this and see, and that is the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that he came upon David. And, you know, David, like Saul, because Saul, when the Holy Spirit came, the scripture said he became a new man. Saul chose to go back to his old nature and his old ways. David, however, surrendered unto the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit exercise himself in other words he clothed himself in david and that's why the fruit of the spirit are able to be exemplified because it is the fruit of the spirit and it's the spirit of the living god being exercised through us so his nature and his character was defined because of his relationship and he allowed the Holy Spirit to remain and to be who he was, except for that one indiscretion. But every other time, you can see that, again, he was led by the Spirit to the things of God, seeking God, seeking counsel. When God came in, he stayed in, and David grew in that wisdom, knowledge, understanding. That is why we can clearly see him as a foreshadowing of Christ Jesus. Because even with Christ, Christ was filled with the Holy Spirit. But in Luke chapter four, he came out of the wilderness. It is the wilderness experiences that help to define and allow the Holy Spirit to bring forth the very 
very nature, the very attributes, the characteristics of God. In Luke chapter four, it says Jesus, he came out of the wilderness in the power of God. David allowed the power of God to be exercised in his life. We have been given that same gift. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And like David, like Christ Jesus, when we surrender unto him, he will lead us into righteousness and the fruit of the Spirit will be exemplified and seen in our lives. Amen. Amen. And I just also want to mention, you mentioned the one indiscretion, which I guess is all we're considering one being all of it happening at the same time, both, both the adultery and the murder, all kind of in one. But um, Psalm 51, you know, shows us what Pastor Jed was talking about with humility and, and how um, and the reason and the difference between Saul and King Saul and King David was his truly repentant heart. Like he obviously understood the need for ongoing repentance when he was, you know, and this is what kept him. This is what kept him in that place that you're referring to, Pastor Sylvia, of power of walking in the spirit. Because again, according to the word, if we live according to the flesh, we'll die. But if we live according to the spirit, which walking in repentance, there's no condemnation, even when we do mess up, because our heart is right with God because of his great mercy for right. what he's already done for us through his son. So praise the Lord. Well, and David, I love what you said. You know, David's the one that knew as far as the East is from the West, so far have you separated my transgressions from me. You know, as David fell on his face and said, against you and you alone have I sinned, right? And he knew God's forgiveness. Well, you know, it's just amazing to me that God chose Moses, David, and Paul. Those three men are all murderers, and all three <laughs> God wrote the Holy Scriptures through. What does that say about God and his power, his sovereignty, and us as vessels, and, you know, working through difficult circumstances, broken circumstances, uh, in order to bring about his purpose and author something through us that's holy, that's beautiful, that, that is God? You know, I just think about Moses, David, and the Apostle Paul. And how much scripture has flowed out of those three vessels and how many human beings have been blessed now because of those lives, those three lives and the lives that they've touched and the lives that, that, that God's words through them that they penned have touched. That is amazing to me to think about as far as the East is from the West, he separated our transgressions from us. And so, yes, we can look at these things, these sin is bad and sin is monstrous and there's consequences, yes. And yet still, it's not going to stop God's plan and purpose because his gifts and his call are irrevocable. And he's going to work through. All things together are going to work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. No, and I believe that that demonstrates part of the beauty of God. You know, I'm amazed in the fact that God knew all of that before they were ever born. He knew that before he placed them in their mother's womb. He knew that. And the fact that God uses what we may consider, you know, the unusable, he says they are absolutely, and through them, I will be glorified because it is not they who that will do it, but it is I that will do it through them. You know, I love the way that God uses those that have, you know, a reputation. He does not look for the, the squeaky clean and the perfect one because in him, we are perfected. It is in our weakness, he is glorified. It is in taking the vessels that, yes, have made mistakes and done things wrong, but God is glorified because in the end, they came to know him and he changed their lives, you know, amen. Uh, and the fact that we can have that same assurance that regardless, our sins are as far from us as the north, I mean, as the um, 
East is from the West. And I love that because those boundaries have never been established. But if God had have said it is from the North to the South, there is a North Pole, there is a South Pole. We would have tried to figure out how many, uh, you know, what the distance is, and then try to equate our sins based on that distance and be like, uh oh, it's getting closer now. But he took boundaries that will never be established or discovered by man so that we can understand that it is unlimited. It can't come back. You can't measure it. You have to know that God has done this and only he could have. Blessed be his holy name. Any other thoughts out there tonight? I know we're coming up on time. I had asked the Lord Jesus how to study the Bible um, because he made my brain and how to show me how to study, you know, because I, I write and it, it's easy or when I write it down to memorize. But anyway, he sent me this and I think it will bless um, a bunch of us on this call because it's just so simple, but it made such perfect sense. And it's called contemplation. It says the four steps of contemplate have been compared to feasting on the word. Reading is taking a bite of food. Meditating is chewing the food. Praying is savoring food. Contemplating is digesting food and making it a part of your body. Too often we are fast food Bible readers, rapidly gulping down the bread of life, John 6, 35. The result is that we are unable to properly absorb our spiritual meal. Instead, slow down, savor your time in God's word, and find joy in meeting God. So Beautiful. I thought you all would enjoy that. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that, Chantal. It's absolutely, uh, and that goes right in line with why we call it bread for the journey. You know, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that God gives. And so we are, we're eating, we're, we're savoring, we're chewing, and we're uh, allow absorbing the, the nutrients that God has given us in his word. As we think about these things, we're being changed. Our minds are being changed. Our thoughts are being affected. Our, our hearts are being affected. And so appreciate that, uh, that encouraging word. Um, I know we're right at nine o'clock, so I'm just going to pray us out. But thank you all so much for going on this journey with us. I love this, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all every Monday night. Uh, it's becoming this awesome rhythm. Um, and I'm grateful to God for you and for the opportunity to study his word together and grow together, learn from one another, and listen to each other as we chew uh, and meditate and contemplate, like Chantel said, and absorb all that nutrients that he's given us. So, Heavenly Father, we just bow our hearts. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters. We thank you, Lord, for the life of David and uh, this one that you set as an example, as a witness amongst all the peoples. Uh, thank you for uh, your hand on him and all that you, you did in his life and what that can teach us about how you want to walk with us in our lives. Um, and Lord, just as you've been faithful uh, to David, you'll be faithful to us because that's who you are. You're covenantally faithful God. And we're only here because you are faithful, you are true, um, and you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we thank you for this time tonight just to chew on the word of God. Pray that you would uh, just by your spirit um, cause there to be a, a, a growth and the, the, the nutrition of this, uh, this word tonight can just go into our hearts into our spirits and bear that harvest, Lord, like we talked about those seeds, the power of God going into our hearts and coming out from us, Lord, uh, that as different circumstances arrive, we could become more like you. We could have your strategy, your wisdom, um, and your character as we face down different uh, just challenges that are going to come our way. But we thank you for your word. We thank you that that uh, you're with us and that you never leave us or forsake us. And I just pray you bless everybody in their week and all the families represented. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, the son of David. Amen.